This morning, we're going back to the uh, book of Hebrews. Uh, again, you can turn that up if you'd like the exercise of being able to locate uh, the books of the Bible in, in your own Bibles. But uh, it will be displayed on the screen behind me. What I'd like to do is read a portion of Hebrews chapter 8, uh, the first five verses, and then read uh, chapter 9. And again, uh, as we're going through this in a way that's um, actually new for me because I'm, I'm used to just delving into a verse at a time and, and uh, trying to you know, find just that teaching and sort of elucidate it through Scripture. What we're doing here is getting more of the bird's eye view, sort of looking at the forest rather than the trees because there is a message in that which we don't want to miss. And we try not to miss it as we go through with a fine tooth cone, but sometimes we do. So anyway, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, and then Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 28. Would you please listen carefully to this? This is God's Word. Now, the main point in what, what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary, and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. Just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle, for see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Now let's skip to um, chapter 9, verse 1. Now even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which is called the holy of holies, having a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod, which budded, and the tables of the covenant." And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body, imposed until a time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered to the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption." For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, 
and it is never in force while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with blood. And according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await Him. By the way, that last paragraph really summarizes everything that we want to see in this, in this section. And the rest of it was just a lot of detail leading up to that. But we'll trust that the Lord will, will show us things from this that will be helpful. Now, again, we've already seen, and by the way, I skipped over that section in chapter 8, those of you who were here um, last week, because we already dealt with the new covenant and the differences in the new covenant. I'll make reference to that just briefly. But what we have seen uh, leading up to this point is that Jesus is obviously a better priest than those of the Levitical order. He is of the order of Melchizedek. He is the one, as we saw last week, who brought a better covenant, one that actually uh, corrects the problem with the old covenant, which we saw, of course, was not really a problem with the covenant itself, but a problem with us because we couldn't keep it. We couldn't keep the law because we didn't want to keep the law because we have the same problem everybody has who is born into this world, the same problem that the Jews had under the system. We all come into this world only, as the Bible says, flesh without the Spirit of God uh, because of Adam's sin. And because we are only flesh, we will only do what the flesh wants, and that is, of course, sin. And that's the reason why we were on our way to judgment. But God fixed the problem in the Old Covenant with the New Covenant. He took that law which we could not obey and He put it in our minds and He wrote it upon our hearts by His Holy Spirit. In other words, in the New Covenant, He gave us the power to keep it. He gave us His Son in order to do the work that was necessary to bring the Spirit back so that our eyes may be opened and our hearts changed so that we would trust His Son, so that, as we'll see this morning, our guilt would be washed away through His sacrifice. He gave us the power also to turn away from our sins so that we might begin to obey Him. That's really all that was needed, as we saw last week, to bring us into a relationship with God, that we might know Him. One of the blessings of the new covenant is that all shall know Him. It won't be that situation where everybody is saying, seek the Lord through the shadows that you may find Him and know Him, but we would know Him in a personal relationship. We would all be His sons and daughters, having trusted in His Son. Now, this is the change that the Lord makes in us in the new covenant. The change, as we see in Scripture, is immediate. It turns the lights on. But it's not perfect. When we first believe, uh, it, it begins, but it grows over our lifetime 
so that we bear more and more of the image of God. We might say more and more of the family resemblance, having been adopted into the family of God. But now, again, the author to the Hebrews wants to show us the main reason why this new covenant even exists. And it's because of the sacrifice that this greater priest has made. And that's what he now begins to examine. Again, he's going to deal with it in chapter 9 and in chapter 10 specifically. Now, I do want to remind you that this, this sermon, this letter which he preached, we might say, although it was a sermon that was preached through writing uh, to these Jews who were professing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they were being tempted to go back into Judaism. They were being tempted to go back to the old covenant, to these types and shadows in order to save their lives from Roman persecution. He is encouraging them not to do that because if they do, they will lose their souls. You cannot be saved apart from the work of Christ. He's encouraging them to hold fast to Christ because Christ is the only way God has provided to save us. There is no other way. If they turn away from this, they'll be destroyed by their sins in God's judgment. But if they hold on to Christ, they will be saved. Now, we understand that that is not exactly our situation today. Uh, you and I are not being tempted to go back into Judaism because we were never really a part of that, I think, at least for most of us here. But we are being tempted to go back into the world from which the Lord has saved us. That temptation is always there. It is always around us. And so we need to guard ourselves. But the reasons why the author to the Hebrews makes as to why the Jews should hold on to Jesus Christ and the warnings that he gives can also serve to help us hold on to Jesus Christ as well and not abandon him. Now, as I've said this morning, he's going to draw a contrast between what the high priest did once a year on the Day of Atonement and what our Lord Jesus Christ did once and for all when he offered himself up on the cross and he entered into that holy of holies, which is the, the tabernacle not pitched by man, not made with hands, but actually into heaven itself to appear before the Father as our high priest. He does that for everyone who trusts in Him. Now, what I want us to do is look at two things. First of all is that Jesus serves in a better tabernacle. He serves in a heavenly one for us. And secondly, that Jesus has a better sacrifice to offer His own precious blood. Now, first of all, let's consider that Jesus serves in a better tabernacle. He serves in heaven itself. This is what He is doing for you if you have trusted in Him. Now, again, you'll notice the author here has described the earthly tabernacle, the one that God commanded Moses to set up while they were still in the wilderness. It's called the tent of meeting, which was a tent because uh, it had to be mobile. Uh, God had not yet given them the land. They had no permanent place to live, so they couldn't build a permanent structure because every time they'd have to move, they'd have to tear it down and rebuild it somewhere else. So they, He gave them a tent. But we do understand when they came into the land that God would give them command to build a temple. Now, what the author to the Hebrews says here, I think, can be equally applied either to the tabernacle or to the temple. They both had these compartments but I do think he uses the tabernacle because he's really contrasting the work of Christ with perhaps the purest form of the ceremonial system when it was uh, instituted through Moses. Now, he describes the two main compartments of this tabernacle. There was an outer one where the day-to-day -day ministry was going on, which is called the holy place, and there was the inner compartment behind the veil a very special place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept and where the wings of the cherubim were stretched over the mercy seat. By the way, that mercy seat was actually a, a throne. It's not a seat anybody would want to sit in. It was a seat that God sat in. And the fact that the uh, angels, uh, the cherubim, which are angels, had their wings overstretching, uh, that was simply to represent what things were like in heaven. This is the place where the high priest entered once per year to atone for the sins of God's people. 
which he says were committed in ignorance. Now, we might ask the question, why only those sins? Why not all of their sins? Well, that's because the Lord had instituted another way for their sins to be dealt with through regular sacrifices, and they already would have sacrificed for those. And yet, there was another group of sins that people commit, that we commit, called sins of ignorance. We don't know this is wrong, and so we, we do these things. And yet, even when we do things that are wrong and we're unaware of it, it still makes us guilty. It's still sin in God's eyes. Uh, ignorance is really no excuse. We hear that over and over again when we visit different countries, and even in our own country. Uh, you know, ignorance of the law is no excuse. You're required to know the law of the land that you're in. And, of course, the Lord required His people also to know His law, but recognizing their weakness, understood there would be those sins they would commit that they really were completely unaware of. And so, He provided a sacrifice that would take care of all those sins as well, at least in a typical way, so that God could dwell among them. By the way, um, understanding that we can sometimes do things and not know that we're really dishonoring the Lord. I think if we really want to show God that we love Him, and if we really want to honor Him, what we can do is read and study His Word more and seek to understand more of what the Lord calls us to do so that we will commit these sins less. But be reminded as well, the best we try, we're still going to be doing things that we're not aware of that are sin. Understand that the blood of Christ, if you trust Him, forgives you of those sins as well. Don't, uh, don't worry about the fact you might have missed some. As a matter of fact, when you do pray, just say, Lord, forgive me for the sins I know I've committed and forgive me for the sins I don't know that I've committed. Forgive me of all sin. The Lord says if we are continually confessing our sins, He is continually cleansing us. So rest in the fact if you trust in Jesus, your sins are forgiven, all of them. Well, again, this inner compartment of the tabernacle was called the Holy of Holies. And if you haven't guessed it yet, perhaps you know by now that it was a picture of heaven. Uh, the author to the Hebrews calls it in chapter 8, verse 5, a copy and a shadow of heavenly things. Actually, while it was being used, it might have been perhaps a bit more than just a copy because on, at least on occasion, God Himself was in that room. He was in that tabernacle in a cloud above the mercy seat, above the cherubim. Although he may not have been literally, as it were, sitting on that throne, it was a representation of the throne of God in heaven. And when the Israelites were living as they should live, God was there in their midst. Now, as we read earlier, God did appear in that cloud over the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, and that's why the high priest would only go into that room once a year to atone for the sins of the people and only after he had offered a sacrifice for his own sins. You have to be very careful how you come into the presence of God. By the way, um, what would you, we already read what would happen if the priest came into the Holy of Holies and he wasn't fully prepared. He would actually be struck down by the holiness of God. Uh, God cannot allow sin in His presence. And as I thought about that, the fact of how God reacts to our sin, I couldn't help escaping what the Lord also tells us about um, the Holy Spirit's interaction with us in this life. The Bible says that we are, in fact, a temple of the living God, that God dwells in us if we've trusted in Him. And how does the Spirit of God within us, within our souls, interact, as it were, with the sins we commit. Well, the Bible tells us that it quenches the Spirit's work because it grieves the Spirit of God. And when that happens, we become spiritually weak. But if we are careful to deal with our sins, as we should, by trusting in Christ, by repenting of all of our sins, as He calls us to do, we will offend this, this holy resident less and we'll have more of His influence in our lives that we might have a greater strength to walk with Him. Now again, what is the point of everything that the author to the Hebrews is showing us here? Well, the point is this, 
that the Levitical priests who served on the earth were actually serving a picture of the true tabernacle which is in heaven. But Jesus is better than they are because Jesus actually serves in heaven itself. He serves the reality. Uh, the Bible says that after He had atoned for our sins, He ascended into heaven. The author to the Hebrews has already reminded us of that very thing. And He sat down at the right hand of God. That is the same thing as His entering within the veil. It's entering into heaven itself. He might even, we might even see Him as the one who actually sits on the mercy seat because it is a throne. And Jesus has been enthroned in the heavens. But He not only rules and reigns over the world and over the things happening in our lives, He's also there as a minister, as a servant, as a priest in the sanctuary and true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, which He made. He's talking about heaven. Heaven is a creation. Heaven is not an eternal thing. But heaven is a creation, a place that God made for the, the angels essentially to begin with, but also for man. Uh, he intended to bring us there. Of course, uh, Adam fell, and, and uh, we know God planned that. That was a part of His plan in order to bring His Son into the world, in order that He might redeem fallen mankind and bring many sons to glory. So it's a place that He also pitched that we may enter into at some point in the future as well. Now, the author tells us that if Jesus were on earth, He couldn't be a priest. We already saw that last time at least not a priest in the Old Covenant system, uh, that then stood. Now, we saw the fact that Jesus is a priest indicated that there was a change in the priesthood. There was a change in the laws that govern that priesthood, and that is true. When Jesus died, it rendered the Old Covenant system, the, sacri the sacrificial system, uh, obsolete. And, and so the laws governing that uh, as well. Uh, that was all set aside, but I think the point the author to the Hebrews is making is this, that even though when Jesus died, and many years have passed now since He died in the writing of the book of Hebrews, uh, I would say around um, 38 years or so, the temple is still standing. Uh, the, the priests are still ministering. They're still offering these gifts and these sacrifices that He reminds us could not make those who offered them perfect, nor the ones on whose behalf uh, they were offered, but again could only point to the one who could, the one who had already came. But God allowed that temple to stand for another 40 years before it became, uh, well, following its actually becoming obsolete because of His care and concern, His compassion and His love literally, for the Jewish people. Uh, God didn't just destroy the temple all at once when Jesus died, but he, he had this transitional period between the death of Christ and the destruction of the temple in which He sent His apostles throughout the, 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 really the entire Roman Empire to preach the gospel to the Jews, to gather them together to Christ before 70 A.D. comes. Now, the author to the Hebrews says that Jesus was not qualified to labor in that temple. If He were on earth, He wouldn't be a priest at all because He is not of the tribe of Levi. But He is qualified to serve in heaven, being of the order of Melchizedek, and that's why His priesthood is so much better because He actually appears in the presence of God in heaven to minister for us. But now we come to the second point, which is, I think, the more important point, and that is that Jesus offered a better sacrifice in that heavenly tabernacle. Now, the author reminds us that a priest is appointed by God, as we've already seen, to stand between God and us in order to reconcile us, in order to bring us both together. And the way He does that is by offering gifts and sacrifices. Well, to be our priest, Jesus had to have something to offer. And what He offered was much better than anything the earthly priest could possibly offer, better than their sacrifices of goats and bulls, which could not cleanse from sin, which could only point to the sacrifice that could cleanse of sin, better than the ashes of the heifer. And if you read the Old Testament, you understand it's talking about the red heifer, 
that was used for ceremonial cleaning. If somebody touched something that was dead, they had to be cleansed by these ashes, by this water of cleansing that was made with these ashes, but they could not cleanse from sin. And because the blood of bulls and goats, because the ashes of the heifer could not cleanse you from sin, they could not save you. But what they couldn't do, Jesus could and did through His sacrifice. Now, the high priest, we read, entered the Holy of Holies through the blood of a bull that allowed him into God's presence at least long enough to offer the blood of the goat on the mercy seat, the blood that pictured the sacrifice that could remove sins. But Jesus entered into heaven through His own blood, blood that was able to atone for all the sins that He bore on the cross, blood that is able to atone from your sins, uh, it's able to cleanse you if you're willing to trust Him in order that you might serve the living God. This is why there is a new covenant. This is why there is a better covenant. This is why there is a covenant that is actually able to reconcile you to God, to make you His sons and daughters, to change your nature, to make you willing to serve Him because Jesus shed His blood. Now, again, I don't think I have to remind you because we've already seen it again and again. Whenever God makes a covenant with man, at least since the fall, the first covenant He made with Adam was without blood. But every covenant that He made since the fall that was a redemptive covenant, now the Noahic covenant was not redemptive, which is why there was no blood in it, that covenant was ratified, it was confirmed with blood. Something had to be sacrificed. A death had to be brought, a representative death, because it represented the wages of sin, which were death, but at the same time would also point us to the death of the substitute that God was going to provide one day through His Son. Now, all the redemptive covenants that God made pointed to Jesus Christ, which is why they were all inaugurated, they were all set in motion, they were all put into force with blood. And that's what the author to the Hebrews talks about when he says that the one who makes the covenant must die. Now, I'm just going to say this as a side note because there's a little bit of um, controversy here regarding what the author of the Hebrews is actually talking about. Perhaps you've heard the new covenant being referred to as a New Testament. As a matter of fact, if you open your Bible, that's usually how they're referred to, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Why is that language used? It's because of what the author says here about the death of the testator, uh, how he has to die before uh, the, anyone can receive the inheritance. Uh, the idea here is that, uh, well, what, what they believe the author to the Hebrews is talking about is a last will and testament instead of a covenant, uh, and that Jesus had to die before the inheritance could be given. But the problem with this view is that it's really foreign to God's dealings with men. Um, it's really foreign to the, uh, the reason why Jesus actually laid down His life. He laid down His life to pay for sin, to atone for sin, uh, to wash us and cleanse us, to satisfy the wrath of God, all of which has nothing to do with dying in order to give us His possessions, you see. Uh, Jesus didn't have to die so that we could have what He had because while He's living, He had it. And that also wouldn't apply to the other covenants that God made where animals were sacrificed because they don't have to die before we can get what they had. The idea of last will and testament is really foreign to the Scripture. This blood is really, a, as I've already said, a representative death. It represents the blood of Jesus Christ, which alone can cleanse us from our sins. It's a representative death that is brought, not the death of the one who makes the covenant, except representatively. If you break the covenant, the sacrifice says that this is what's going to happen to you. The wages of sin is death. But again, it reminds us of that greater sacrifice that God would provide in our place. Yes, we've sinned. Yes, we deserve death. But God provides His Son to die in our place. So even the Mosaic covenant, even the first covenant, the one the author is contrasting with the new, was inaugurated with blood. 
After Moses read what God required in that covenant and the people agreed to do it, we read actually in Exodus 24 that Moses sprinkled both the book and the people with the blood as well as the tabernacle and all the vessels used in that service according to God's command because everything was to be cleansed, or at least almost everything was to be cleansed with blood. There were a few exceptions. Some things were washed with water. The ashes of the red heifer was a cleansing without blood. Some things were cleansed by fire. But he reminds us of one point we don't want to miss. There was no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. There had to be the shedding of blood. By the way, there was a sacrifice that somebody who was really poor could offer that didn't contain blood, but it was only because of God's compassion and it was only because that grain sacrifice still was pointing towards Jesus Christ. Without the shedding of blood, the author to the Hebrews says, there is no forgiveness. But again, remember, these sacrifices could not take away sin. They could only point to the one sacrifice that could, and that is the blood of Christ. Now, again, the author's main point, the earthly copy was cleansed with the blood of animals, and they pointed to Jesus Christ. The heavenly things they pictured were cleansed with a better sacrifice, the blood of Christ Himself. Now, I don't think the author to the Hebrews is saying that heaven was unclean and needed to be cleansed because we're talking about heaven here. But what he's saying is that all of God's covenants are ratified with blood, and the new covenant was ratified with the best blood of all, that of God's own Son. The author says that he only had to do this once. The high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies once a year at the peril of his life to sacrifice for the sins of God's people, but Jesus had to enter only one time. He had to offer Himself only one time because through that one offering, He not only cleansed everyone who had trusted Him from the very foundation of the world to the time that sacrifice was made, but everyone who would trust in Him from that moment forward to the end. By one offering, He has sanctified for all time everyone who will trust in Him. Now, the author also reminds us, and this is the word of warning he leaves us with, that Jesus is going to come again. Only the next time He comes, He's not coming to deal with sin because He's already dealt with that once and for all, but rather it's going to be to gather those who eagerly are waiting for Him. Now, do you want to be ready to meet the Lord when He comes again? He comes at His second coming, or perhaps more likely when He comes for you at your death? Do you want to be ready for that? The only way that you can be ready is by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, by trusting Him as your priest, by laying your whole hope of heaven on Him, and as we see in the table as well as what the author to the Hebrews has said, looking to His sacrifice because it is the only sacrifice that can take away your sin and make you ready for heaven. This is the only way that God has provided. You can't come to God any way you please. You're not good enough on your own. You'll never be good enough. Our works are like a mound of refuse in God's eyes. We're like filthy rags before the Lord. The only sacrifice that will make you ready is the sacrifice of Christ. You need this priest, you need his sacrifice, you need his righteousness. And so the point of the author to the Hebrews is, and the point of the whole Bible is this, trust in the Lord and He will cleanse you and He will prepare you for heaven. He will be the anchor of your soul. Well, I hope you're trusting in Jesus Christ. If you're not, I hope you will trust Him this morning by His grace. Let's bow for a few moments of prayer and let's ask the Lord to take what we've heard and to apply it to us.